Pauline Gardner, who makes an interesting point when you spoke earlier. A lot of people in this country don't talk about not taking drugs at all as an option. Right, thanks everybody. I'm going to have to use this board because um, I want to clearly illustrate to you where my thoughts and perceptions come from. And A, I'm not an expert at all, but I have worked for a long time with people who have adversely uh, been affected by, uh, by drugs. And when I say drugs, that includes alcohol. And so most of what I've learned, I've actually learned at the front line, as you, as you say, and coupled with you know, scientific studies and papers, this is where I think we should be. And I think if we could, if, if we could base our drug policies on something like this, we wouldn't have meetings like this anymore because I think it would resolve the issue of decriminalisation. It would d resolve the issues between classifications of drugs. I've never supported classifications of drugs. And I'll just show you why. And hopefully it'll become a little bit clear. This is a population, if you, can you sort of hear if I'm going back and forth? A, a population of a population, about 10% of a population don't use anything for a variety of reasons. Religious, poor health, good health, afraid of the police, whatever it might be, but about 10% don't use. Of the remaining 90%, just easy for me to do it this way because it's around figures instead of 68 and 18 and 9, approximately 70% of people use something from time to time. We don't have to preach to them. They exercise their own judgment. They don't drink or use dope while they're happy while they're pregnant. They don't drink and drive. They don't use drugs before or after work. They don't do it in front of their kids. They self-regulate. They harm minimize themselves. So all sorts of things work for them. With this one, we don't start our drug policy here. We do not validate non-use. We never do. None of our education, none of our drug policy, nothing validates non-use. Good on you, little Johnny. It's really nice that you've, you know, so-so. 70% don't need that. 70% just need ongoing education. If there's any update on some health risks with whatever they're taking, um, if it's found that it's detrimental to something they're doing with or to their kids, and, and they do that, don't drink and drive type thing. So that's about it. Education works there. Education validation. <coughs> education works here. But within this here, there are about three different approaches. Here we come to about 20% of people who abuse whatever they're using. That is diagnosable under the DSM-4. That's the Worldwide <coughs> Bible of Mental Health Disorders. And that's easy. This is where harm minimization should be targeted because harm minimization is what you do to someone when they're already doing something. It's when something's going wrong or you fear it's going to go wrong or you're trying to help them not to go wrong. We can easily diagnose this. And how do we treat it? We intervene through a variety of means. We can threaten, we can bribe, we can educate, we can cajole, we can minimise, we can control, and if the judge says to me, Pauline, if you come to me again to have a drink driving for your sixth time, I'll take your car away. And I think, oh shit, I better get some transport home. So that works. <laughs> and that is diagnosable. We've got about 10% of the population who meet criteria for dependency. That is also diagnosable under the DSM-4. And what you have to do there is intervene again but you have to treat. It is no good controlling drinking for an alcoholic. You have to treat and you have to continue to educate and then you have to see where do they go from here. The government's job, the society's job, I believe, hopefully, is to keep as many, and I, I really talk about kids because I think we should really target the lowest common denominator. Try and keep as many kids as we can here. That's called prevention. It's not prohibition. It's trying to validate and try and keep as many as we can there for as long as we can. And I can tell you of the 2,000 or more kids I work with in Wellington, their average, average starting age for use for dope and alcohol was between 12 and 12 and a half. Now to get that mean, you know where they're starting. A large number of these kids are starting dope use at 8, 9 and 10. Even the hardened users amongst us 
would not subscribe to that, to that. Here, again, you just try not to get them to move into that area there. And so you do that by you know, maintaining education and, and whatnot, and if you can move a few to there, one and good. Here, there's an invisible line, and the difference between that and that is the loss of cognitive choice. That's addiction. Invisible. So and this is a difficulty in treatment. How do you know who's going to be affected that way? Well, you don't, but there are a couple of pointers. Genetics and mental health history. And then sort of coupled along that is the nurture and environmental things that go along with these things. Okay? And so you, the DSM-4, one of the criteria for dependence is that you have never met the criteria for abuse. So you can't get your dependent people to go back to controlled drinking. They have to come back to abstinence. So none of these is mutually exclusive. <coughs> There's not an issue between abstinence and use. There's, that is where <coughs> harm minimization is working already. That is where harm minimization needs to work. And if we got that right, if we understood addiction in our country, then these people should be left alone. Most of you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The only time then is that when you come to someone's notice, and you will if you start moving here, it'll be your family, your wife, your employer, your teacher, whatever, they will notice something's going wrong. And then it is your responsibility to accept the fact that you are being asked to have an intervention, to determine your level of problem and whether there is a problem to the people around you. That's my lot. Thank you.